Hey guys, this is John. This is a video covering a few important Rook end games. I actually have a series where I used a physical board to go over end games very similar to this, Central Rook end games. That was recorded a while back, maybe two years ago. I will link that in the comments below. So that may be a bit of review if you've already seen that series, but it never hurts to brush up on these end games. And I wanted to show you how important it is to know these end games in the context of an over the board game I played. This was played in October of 2017 in Stavanger, Norway. I was over there playing a couple events. And this particular tournament was not going that well for me. This was round seven. I was losing rating points and wasn't really feeling it in this event, but still trying to fight hard every game. And we joined the game very late, move 72. And my opponent, who's rated 2054, Norwegian teenager, was actually outplaying me prior to this. I was down a pawn and I was having to fight for my life, but then in a mutual time scramble, I actually succeeded in going up a pawn and we reached this position. So it was white to move and my opponent correctly played king f2 here. So again, my pawn is going this way and he correctly is trying to get his king in front of the pawn. I played rook d2 check. White played king g1, again, correct, get in front of the pawn. And now here, I've played, I think, the best practical try to win this position. So I played king h3. So this gives white a choice, if white wants to check, a choice of which square to check on, rook h5 or rook e3 check. And unfortunately for my opponent, he played neither of those moves. And in fact, he played a losing move here. And if you immediately know what the correct idea is for white in this position, give yourself a pat on the back. You probably studied your rook end games before. So one of the checks is fine. And in fact, there's another move that draws pretty easily for white. And you got to know it. If you're studying your end games, this is an essential position to know. If you want a little time to figure it out, feel free to pause your video. But white can draw in two ways. So white can either play rook e3 check, or they can play rook e1 directly. In either case, though, the idea will be to set up the first rank defense. So let's say white plays rook e1 directly. Looks extremely passive to do this, but it's important to know that I'm looking to play check here, force the king here, and then deliver another check, whereupon white will not be able to keep their king in front of the pawn. And as we'll see, that's exactly what happened in the game. So by playing rook e1, white ensures that there's no check on the back rank. And despite the dominating position here that black appears to have, there's no way to break down white's defenses, especially so long as white keeps their king on g1 or h1. So let's say white plays, or black plays rather, g3. White's just going to wait, rook a1, toggle the rook on the first rank. And I need to leverage this king out of the g1 square and try to promote the pawn, but not simple to do. We can even try to do it with checks. So rook g2 check, king h1. Again, white's waiting between these two squares. Rook h2 check, king here. And no amount of maneuvering is going to help black. You know, if ever black runs away with the rook, white will just wait on the first rank. White is not interested in doing anything active. Black's king already occupies basically the best possible square. And note that if black gets too greedy here, I've actually even seen people lose this endgame because they'll play g2, looking to go rook h1 check in an ideal world, but that runs into rook c3 check. White can deliver a third rank check force the king to the fourth rank, then take the rook and win the game. That would be a pretty big reversal. So this is vintage first rank defense. It works against a knight or a rook pawn. And in fact, it's not a bad strategy at all if you're the defensive side in these positions to go directly for this. Put your king in front of the pawn, whether it's on the knight file or the rook pawn file, and wait with your rook on the back rank. And there's no way for your opponent to crack that fortress. And it doesn't matter if they push the pawn all the way up uh, or if they try to keep their, their pawn back, if they use their king, just know that you want to go between those two squares. Likewise, I was mentioning white had a check here. Rook e3 would work. This doesn't change anything because of g3, white can still go rook e1. It's just important to take up that first rank defense. Now, let's see what happened in the game. So we were both getting very low on time here, and my opponent was playing on the increment. So there was a 30-second increment in this game. And yeah, he was getting very low on the clock and I, I saw his hesitation at this point and I actually thought there's a big chance that he's going to play the wrong move here uh, because he did not he seemed to be racking his brain trying to recall what exactly to do here and uh, again importance of knowing these end games off the top of your head and having that ability to recall them immediately so he played rookie eight 
which in many cases could be the correct idea to try to give checks. But here I can play rookie one check, force king f2, and now I get in this pawn push with check. He played king f3, trying to keep his king relatively close to the pawn. But now I play rook f1 check, king's forced all the way over to the e-file, and now I play g2, threatening to promote. He played rook h8, I went king g3, and again, give yourself another pat on the back if you know what type of rook end game this is heading towards. So king h2, rook h1 check, king g1, and he played rook e8. So now we're in the Lucina position, also known as building the bridge. And here I played rook f5. And the idea is I want to bring my king out, but you don't want to bring your king out right away because I'm going to be subject to a barrage of checks. I was actually just trying to hide it from those checks. So by playing my rook out to this rank, I'm hoping to bring my king out when I have some protection. In this case, I'm actually also threatening rook h5, which would cover the h-file. And I could slide my king over and look to promote this pawn. So my opponent played rook e7 here and allowed rook h5, but had he covered the file, so rook h8, here we have the Lucina technique in, in all its glory. I would have played rook e5 check. Let's say the king is going to the d file. Now I can bring my king out on the f file here, threatening to promote. White may give a check. King g3, again, still threatening to promote. Check. Now here's the hard part. You want to go to one of these two squares. So let's say king f3. And if white continues delivering checks, eventually we're able to interpose with this rook. So that's the reason we back that rook up to f5, to the fifth rank. And you can see that white's king is too far away from the pawn. And after the trade of rooks, this pawn is just going to promote. Nothing else white can do. Uh, just a couple notes here. So if you're ever defending this hopeless endgame, it is totally losing. But a trick you might want to try is king d3. I actually tried a similar trick against Ding Loren in that pro chess league game if you watch that video but the idea of this is to try to bait black into playing rook e4 looking to block run this inner position on the fourth rank but that would run into rook takes g2 with a very nice deflection king takes g2 king takes e4 uh, but there's other ways to win for instance black can play rook e3 check to try to force the king to an unfavorable square if king here now rook e4 is just fine and black's gonna run the deflection on the fourth rank uh, or if king d4, same thing, rook e4 check followed by rook g4. And once again, those of you who know the theory of this endgame may know this, but this rook f5 move is correct because it's just out of range of the king and still allows you to run the inner position when you eventually bring your king out. So as I said, though, in the game after rook f5, my opponent just waited on the e-file actually played rook e7, and I played rook h5 covering the file. And yeah, not a whole lot for white to do. Even though I've given, given up the f-file here, if white tries to play king f3, uh, there's a number of moves that win. I think I probably would have played just king h1. And the king being close doesn't help because whether white checks here or plays rook g7, I'm promoting. And white's going to have to uh, resign soon. So rook h5, he played rook g7, but I'm covering the file now. I played king h1. Here white resigned. The only way to play... To try to stop me from queening is king f2, but then I give this check, and once again, black's going to promote on the next move. So this was a bitter disappointment for my opponent. Uh, again, he he played pretty well prior to this and was outplaying me, actually, and we got to this position in a time scramble. Uh, young Norwegian player, quite promising, and just one of these moments where you know it's, it's really important to know these endgames cold, and despite the loss that he had in this game, I have no doubt he's he's ever going to mess up this first rank defense ever again. So just as a little bonus here, it's always helpful when you're analyzing endgames to try to compare similar endgames. So as I was preparing for this video, I was thinking to myself, like from the beginning, what would be the evaluation if we shifted everything over to the right? So we just take this position, shift it over one file to the right, because if we, if we have a shift to the left, not that the king can go that much further left for black, but if we had the pawn here, we know it's still going to be a draw because of the first rank defense. But what if we have the following position? So before I proceed with this analysis, let's say it's white to move again here. If you want to challenge, ask yourself, what should white do? And assuming best play from both sides, what's the correct result? Okay, so let's analyze this endgame. So this should still be a draw. 
It's harder for white, but white can still draw this. Now, let's say white plays the correct move here, king e2. I would go check once again, king here. And then the same pressing up move with the king, king g3. This is definitely the best way to try to win because if we play king f3, we actually get into another type of theoretical endgame. King f3 looks correct to try to deliver a check down here, but white can play rook d3 check. And when the king goes somewhere, let's say to e4 even, white can wait along the third rank, third rank with their rook. And even though we're on the third rank here, this is sometimes called the sixth rank defense or the Philidor defense. And assuming this pawn advances, now white can go back or go all the way down to the eighth rank and start delivering checks here. And the fact that black can't hide their king in front of the pawn prevents black from even trying to win this. So, you know, black might play king e3 here, looking to go rook c1 mate, but white just starts giving these checks, and there's no good shelter for the black king. The black king would have to start zigzagging and try to approach the rook, which would be a very easy draw for white. White would double back and attack the pawn. Uh, or black might start going towards their own rook, but again, they're going to get too far separated from the f pawn. So that's in the case that Black plays king f3 here. So that's why this king g3 option is kind of tricky for white, because I retain the option, if I'm black here, of using the pawn as shelter, using it as a shield if white delivers a check here, or even checks from g5. That said, though, if you know your rook endgames, you can still draw this position if you're white. So again, if you want to pause your video and try to find the best move, feel free to do that. So the correct move here for white, the best technical move is rook f5. A little bit surprising, so actually trying to go behind the pawn here. It's a similar idea to the Philidor defense though, so if black plays this very natural move f3, you're ready to deliver checks. There's just enough distance to be able to do this before you know black tries to hurt you like this. King here, and now you can go away with the rook, rook g8, and start giving these checks again. And note that if black tries to check you, that doesn't bother white at all. White's king is in a perfect position. Uh, what I should also mention is, before we get too much further, again, trying to compare endgames. After king g3, in this case, it would not be appropriate for white to go for uh, the first rank defense. Because after f3, black can squeeze this king out from in front of the pawn. So let's just say white has the same policy of trying to wait. The problem here is we're going to play rook h2, threatening rook h1 mate. White will have to play king g1. And then because we have a bishop pawn and not a knight pawn... Black can play f2 check, king f1, and now really leverage this king out of the corner or out of in front of the f-pawn. King e2, rook takes a1, and black wins. Whereas before with the knight pawn, we were getting this position, but with the black king here and the pawn on g3, and that wasn't helping black because remember g2 was running into rook a3 check. So again, always good to try to compare end games and uh, compare moves in the course of analyzing things. So... Joining this again after king g3, when white plays this correct move, rook f5. Uh, what's the trickiest move again for black to try to win? Well, I think it's king f3. Again, f3 is going to run into checks. Also, rook here check could be attempted, but looking to get the king out from in front of the pawn. But after king e2, this again shows the benefit of having the rook on the f-file for white. This stops f3 check, and despite white's king being a little out of position... Black can't capitalize on this because f3 check is just not possible and black doesn't have a whole lot else good to do here. If they play some sort of waiting move, say with the rook over, white can give this check here and force the king to the h file, which definitely doesn't help black. So again, trickiest move for black, best practical try, king f3, using this pawn as a, as a shield and threatening rook f1. Now here, white faces another task. Uh, because at this point, white has to move their king due to the threat of mate. You definitely don't want to block with the rook here. Again, passive defense in general when you're up against a bishop pawn or a center pawn is not going to work. But here, this just loses trivial, trivially because black can simplify to a winning pawn ending. So you got to choose. You must choose which way to go with the king, king e1 or king g1. And this leads to another theoretical endgame. If you want to pause your video one more time and ask yourself which square to choose, you can do, th do so now. Choose wisely. Okay, so if the term short side, long side came to mind, congratulations, you probably got this right. Or maybe you got it wrong and you mixed up, mixed up those terms, which way to go with the king. 
Uh, King G1 is correct. Going to the so-called short side of the board with the king. So if you take the enemy pawn and draw a line to opposite sides of the board, then this shorter line is the short side. This longer side, longer line represents the longer side. And it's always king to the short side. So your rook, the defensive side's rook, can go to the long side to deliver checks against the enemy king. Okay, and we'll explore this in a second. But, you know, interestingly enough, I searched my database from this position and I actually found a game that was played from here. Uh, this was a game Harley versus Ivanov, played in London, 1991. And White chose incorrectly in that game. They played king e1. And this now loses. Black played rook c1 check. White went king d2. Black played rook a1. Actually, better to play the immediate rook f1, but rook a1 doesn't change anything. White waited with the rook here. So note now, White's king is out of position. And White doesn't have a lot of useful checks to deliver. Uh, and Black played rook f1, getting ready to move this king here to g2 and then start marching the f-pawn. And here's how the game went. White waited, then gave a check when black played king g2. Note that the rook is defending the pawn on f4, very handy. So rook g2 check, or g7 check rather, king f2. The rook came back, the pawn was pushed. Again, white waited, black went away, gave a check. And slowly but surely, black got into a Lucina position. Yeah, and now here after king g2, white resigned. Black didn't even have to go through the normal Lucina procedure because uh, f1 is such a, a big threat. And if white starts checking, black can actually zigzag their king on the g and the h files just towards the white rook because the rook and the pawn are always combining to threaten f1 queen. And this whole setup was a problem because the checks that white would like to deliver are not uh, going to lead to very much. So if white were to try to check from the short side now, so again, this is the short side, it's not going to lead to anything. So let's say black plays uh, king g2, again, making way for the pawn to advance. There's no lateral checks here. White just gets cut off from the, the edge of the board. Also advancing the king over doesn't help. Black's advancing with check here. So really the only checks white can give are from the g file. And this is similar to what happened in the game. Black slowly but surely got into the Lucina position. So why is king g1 drawing then, going to the short side with the king? Well, if we play through this, rook c1 check, king here. Let's say black plays rook f1, similar technique to that Ivanov game that Ivanov won. Black's looking to play this and then advance the f-pawn. Here, white swings the rook all the way over. And because there's so much distance between the white rook and the black king, there's going to be this barrage of checks. So let's say black plays king e2 here, check from the side. A luxury white didn't have on the short side with the rook. Say here, check. Uh, white could probably even play king g2 here, and that'd be fine because that would hit the rook, but just check. If you can set up that checking distance, it helps you so much when you're drawing because the enemy king has to go so far away to ever, ever try to get close to you. And then you'll slide your king over. White will win this pawn. No, no problem for white. Game drawn. So... It's interesting how in this one endgame that I played in a tournament, we can see a number of different theoretical and must-know endgames. So we saw the first rank defense, the Philidor defense, also known as the sixth rank defense, short side, long side, uh, the Lucina position. We just hit a bunch of major rook endgames right there. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you want another challenge, by the way, again, try to compare positions, shift everything over to the file uh, to the right one more time. So... Black king on f4, black pawn here, white king here, rooks here and here, etc. And let me know what you think about that position. Does that change the evaluation? Uh, maybe post in the comments if you want to conduct your own analysis on that. All right, so thank you guys for watching. And I will post the links to those uh, videos that I did on rook end games with the physical board. Hope you guys learned something from this. And I'll be back again soon with another video. Bye, guys.